Hello, I'm Michael Little, president of the Christian Broadcasting Network. The events taking place around us each day can be frightening, but for those who put their trust in God and act wisely, there is security and excitement about the days to come. In just a moment, you'll see how the events taking place in our nation and in the world are preparing the way for a tremendous spiritual harvest. Right now, let me remind you to take time to read the letter we've enclosed with this video and respond as generously as possible. Our goal here at CBN in the next 60 months is to see 500 million decisions for Christ in your community and in the far reaches of our world. To answer this powerful calling, we need you to stand with us. We thank you for your faithfulness and prayers. Together, we can be part of the greatest ministry effort in modern history. Now, please enjoy Signs of the Times 95. Will the convenience of digital cash bring a new era of safety and security? Or an end to your financial privacy? Death toll rises as rescue Are we seeing the back warning back. signs that signal the end of the age? Is there hope for our future? Now, a 700 Club special, Signs of the Times. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this important series of programs, Signs of the Times 95. Are the startling stories we watch on the evening news a sign of greater devastation of head? We'll take a look at what we have here. What if you could be certain your money was safe from thieves and that the IRS would never audit you and that you didn't have to worry about banking? Sound good? But what if all these benefits came at a price? Businesses, marketers, and the government having complete knowledge maybe even control over your financial activities. Those are the promises and the threats of the coming revolution in money. This revolution will usher in an era of digital cash being commonplace. Digital cash is money stored and transferred electronically through computers around the country and around the world. And this revolution is already underway. Visa envisions a future banking environment where changes over the next decade will equal or exceed those created during the past century. Digital money has the same value as paper currency or credit cards, and it's already used by major financial institutions. One place we'll likely see digital money is on the so-called information superhighway. By the year 2000, over one billion people worldwide may be plugged into the Internet, the worldwide computer network linking smaller networks and personal computers. Those who use the net will need a safe way to buy and sell in cyberspace. This is going to change all of our lives. Uh, there's a writer for the New York Times a year ago that called this the mother of all markets. But the uses of digital money will go far beyond the Internet and computers, into the world of normal financial transactions, of routine buying and selling. In other words, people watching this broadcast could regularly be using digital money within the next decade. And now imagine Mondex, the first worldwide alternative to cash. The conversion from regular paper money to digital money is a worldwide phenomenon. Mondex is a British consortium that hopes to take their form of digital money worldwide. The giants of personal finance like Visa, MasterCard and Europay are also racing to cash in on this new form of money around the world. Digital money for personal finance is based on what's called a smart card or a chip card. It looks like a regular credit card, but has a computer chip implanted in the card that can hold digital money. Everything will be replaced by the chip card. In fact, it not only will replace all the cards in your wallet, it will replace your wallet. More than 20 projects are underway around the world to develop these electronic wallets. From Australia to England to Hong Kong, people are learning to use these cards in everyday life. Smart card technology can be used for just about everything you do. For healthcare information, to pay road tolls, ride on public transportation, or use pay-per-view television. These electronic wallets or smart cards are gaining acceptance on university campuses in the U.S. One example is Florida State University. It's turning its student ID card into an electronic checkbook. The card can be used to make a telephone call, do the laundry, or even pay tuition. 
we've all read and heard about the Cashless Society, and I think this is a, a, a perfect indication that the Cashless Society is here today. The dawn of the Cashless Society may be here with all its promise, but it could also bring peril. Information on personal finance is becoming increasingly computerized. This information will make it possible to track everything you do, including every single purchase you make. And the government is already starting to get into the digital act. The IRS is planning to have computer access to salaries, investment income, and other individual financial activities. That access could come as soon as next year. Analysts fear it could be the beginning of an important trend of government monitoring of private financial transactions. And soon your financial activities could be more personal than ever. What if a smart card is lost or stolen? Simple, implant the technology right into the body. Some believe a new technology called biometrics will soon be integrated with smart card technology. Biometrics is a technology that uses parts of the body like the hand, fingerprint, voice or the eyes to reliably identify the user of the smart card. One system is being tested right now for frequent business travelers going through customs. The system combines a card and the use of a three-dimensional hand scan to verify that the person with the card is actually the one who should be using it. One of the world's leading computer experts thinks this trend towards linking the identity of the person with the card in the interest of security may eventually lead to a computer chip or some future sort of electronic implant with all the financial and medical history implanted in the human body. It's already done with animals, and unlikely as it may seem now, it may happen with people. One more indication of the brave new world that may be on the horizon. Chris Mitchell, CBN News. Ladies and gentlemen, never in the history of mankind has such a thing as this taken place. Henceforth, within the next several years, possibly by the end of this decade, there might not be any more cash money. All of your money will be located on a computer. It will be in computer files, computer digital memory, computer storage, however that storage takes place. And nobody will be able to access it without the appropriate card. And the card, in turn, will register every transaction that you make, every time you buy, every time you sell. And you will not be able, under that system, to purchase anything in a store because they won't take cash anymore. It will only be through the card. Every transaction will be instantaneously recorded. And, of course, everywhere you go, every time you buy gasoline, every time you get on an airplane, every trip, every, every purchase, everything will then be under the scrutiny of Big Brother. Does that sound frightening? You say, well, it'll sure save a lot of time and energy on the banks. Uh, it'll save money in printing all those ugly old dollar and hundred dollar bills. It will save having all those checks and all that paper and the bankers see it as paradise uh, to save money and be more efficient. But let me read to you right now what the Bible had to say about 2,000 years ago about this. And he causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one should be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. And the computer that currently is in existence with the SWIFT, the Society of Worldwide Interfund Transfers in Brussels, guess what its name is? Quote, the beast. It is so big, it is so powerful, and it records all the uh, bank transactions every day, at least $100 billion. Now, the Bible warned us of such a time, but you say, we don't have a world government yet. And I've been uh, subject to all kinds of scorn and ridicule because I warned about the existence one day of a world government. And they say, well, all that is is just nutty conspiracy theories. Well, think about this for a moment. Assume a major natural disaster of killer earthquakes or a meteorite striking the earth and suddenly the nations are faced with crisis and they must move together for survival. And out of that comes a federation of nations and then there comes a one world government. It could happen very, very quickly. And the instruments are in place now in the remotest parts of the earth to monitor the movement of every single person and they could not buy or they could not sell. 
without this little device. And now they say, we wouldn't have to implant something under your skin. We could tattoo it on because it's possible with the technology available that will be available to have a little tattoo on your hand and that will, would, would be um, sufficient to record your life and death transactions. Now let me ask you something. When this brave new world is coming, where are you going to be? What is going to be your relationship? Because the Bible says that those who take the mark of the beast, who submit to this world system, are one day going to find that they're in league with the enemy and they're opposed to God because there will be more than merely buying and selling. It will have to do with religious faith and religious belief and worship of this central power. It won't all come at once, but it'll come gradually, but it will always be with an economic veneer. The economics will drive the politics, which in turn will drive the religion. And only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life are going to be able to survive. Now, this isn't some pie in the sky. People have been talking in Bible uh, uh, lectures for hundreds of years about what Revelation had to say, and they always thought of something in the future, and they couldn't conceive of it. Until in our day, we can conceive of it. It is here, now, in effect, starting. Right now, very benign. Right now, very useful. Right now, very cost-effective. No question about it. But where will it lead? It will lead to economic domination and control of all the advanced nations on the earth, every single human being. It can do that if it's in the wrong hands. And given the fragile state of world politics, it could get into the wrong hands very easily. Now, what about you? Only those who know Jesus Christ are going to be able to make it through these days. Only those who have given their hearts to Jesus Christ and who are safe and in Him will be the survivors. They're the only ones when the Lord brings a new heaven and a new earth are going to be part of it. And I wonder right now for you, are you ready? If some horrible thing happens on the earth, if there is some natural disaster of monumental proportions, if there is one day some type of a world dictatorship uh, more uh, evil than communism or Nazism, if such a thing happens, are you ready? And if the answer is no, I want you to do something right now. Don't touch that dial. I want you to pray with me right at this minute. I want you to bow your head, and I want you to let Jesus Christ come into your heart today, wherever you are. Pray now, and don't be ashamed and don't be afraid. Pray these words. Bow your head. Husbands and wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, parents, children, pray with me. These words, Jesus, that's right, Jesus, I know that you're the Lord of glory. And I know, Jesus, that you hold the future, for you are the future. And so, Lord, today, I want to commit my life to you because I know a long time ago that you died on the cross for me. And I know, Jesus, that you rose from the dead that I might have everlasting life. And so now I receive you as my Savior and I make you the Lord of my life. Come now, Jesus, into my heart. Live your life in me and I will live for you and I will serve you all the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus, that you have heard my prayer. And thank you, Jesus, that you have come in to my heart. And Father, for those who pray just then, may the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God touch them, and may they be kept safe. Whatever happens on this earth, may they be one with God and with his son, Jesus Christ. I believe that, Lord, for them in your holy name. Fill them with the Spirit now. Amen. Unprovoked, senseless, deadly violence is running rampant in America. It's a shocking sign of the times when children are not only the victims, but the killers. It's the juvenile murder rate skyrocketing in America. The number of teenagers who kill has more than doubled since 1985. 
That's the bad news. The really bad news is that the worst is yet to come. Death toll rises as rescue Are we seeing the, the warning signs that signal the end of the age? Is there hope for our future? Now, a 700 Club special. Signs of the Times. Welcome to this powerful special series. We live in a frightening age where a quick lane change can get you shot. A comment in the checkout line can get you killed. Our sense of security has been stripped away by the ominous violence that blankets our communities. Vicious, brutal, disgusting, horrible, pick a word. America the Beautiful in 1995 is becoming America the Bullet Ridden. Nobody is this dead! Oh my God! I can't believe this happened! We saw a girl laying on the ground with a whole bunch of blood on her. Something is wrong desperately wrong. America is in the grips of a terrorizing crime wave. With death a constant headline, the bloodshed is spreading from the mean streets to Main Street. A nation held hostage in horror, millions are immobilized by a fear that's become the grim reality of an America at risk. I'm just terrified. I am scared to death that these kids have to resort to this kind of violence. Despite continued drops in the overall crime rate, the FBI reports an unprecedented rise in random violence. Since 1984, violent crime is up 38.4 percent, and with the explosion in gang violence up a shocking 371 percent since just 1980, more and more victims are falling prey to unknown assailants, and it seems nobody is safe. After four decades of steadily rising crime rates, a six-fold increase in armed robbery and aggravated assault, a tripling in the number of rapes, a doubling of the murder rate, the question is, why? You see the kids walking around, you see their faces, you still don't, uh, still don't get it. Why? why? How, what happened? What, what did this? Various studies have shown that perhaps the greatest single cause of the rise in the crime rate is the breakup of the family. One research report showed that those states with fewer single-parent families also have lower rates of juvenile crime. And in general, each 10% increase in the number of children in single-parent homes accompanies a 17% increase in juvenile crime. And it's getting worse. That's according to James Fox, the nation's foremost criminologist, who's predicting a crime wave in the U.S. over the next 10 years. Well, we're right now in the lull before the crime storm. Uh, if you think it's bad enough already with uh, juvenile murder rates skyrocketing in America, the, the number of teenagers who kill has more than doubled since 1985. That's the bad news. The really bad news is that the worst is yet to come. We may have a bloodbath in teen murder over the next 10 years. Fox heads the Department of Criminology at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts, where he has studied the nation's murder rate for nearly 20 years. Using computer modeling, Fox has a data bank of 380,000 murderers that enables him to project crime trends. Teenagers, 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds committing homicide. I can see five, 6,000 of, of them doing that every year in the United States uh, in, in the not too distant future. 15 years ago, we had hundreds. So, bloodbath may be a strong word, but maybe it's a word that will motivate. Consider an American snapshot. Philadelphia, December 1994. Alter boy Eddie Powlett is beaten to death with a baseball bat by a group of kids from a neighboring town. Everyone gets in fights with different neighborhoods, and it's just never been like anything like this. San Antonio, Texas, January 1995. This 12-year-old girl is undergoing psychiatric evaluation in connection with charges she killed two-year-old Rene Gutierrez. They kill over trivial reasons, over a leather jacket, over a pair of sneakers, over no reason at all. And that's what's so frightening about juvenile murder. It's just so senseless. Apparently the six-year-old had been beaten by, the, by this 10-year-old girl several times in, in the past. And, uh, wasn't going to be beaten today. I think that they went home and bragged about it that night, not thinking that they killed somebody. The uh, perpetrators made demands for his uh, chain and medallion. When he refused to give it up, at that point he was shot one time in the stomach. Quite shocking. Normally little children like this uh, 
uh, fights never get to this level, and, and it's uh, real sad. That sadness is sounding a warning cry that's ringing loud and clear in cities like Chicago, where last year police arrested a 10-year-old neighbor boy in the brutal slaying of an 84-year-old woman. Maybe we're going to have to change the way we think in this city and around the country, but usually you don't consider uh, your prime suspects to be 11 years old. We've all become desensitized to violence a little bit. Um, in fact, there's been a decline in the notion of moral responsibility in America. That's no news to you. But more and more people have taken the message too far. The slogan used to be, I'm okay, you're okay. And for some, it's, I'm okay, you're dead. Kim Farrell, CBN News. Ladies and gentlemen, this is America. This is the land of the free and the home of the brave, but this is one of the signs of the times. That's what we're talking about today because Jesus Christ said, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the day before the Son of Man returns, the end of the age. And here's what the Bible says went on in the days of Noah. I want you to read it carefully from the book of Genesis. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. That's one of the signs, ladies and gentlemen, that takes place before the end of the age we're in. And we call your attention to what's happening in the United States of America so you'll realize the signs of the time. seeing the warning signs that signal the end of the age. Is there hope for our future? Now, a 700 Club special, Signs of the Times. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this vital series of programs. Today, the occult. Despite its deadly effects, it has entered our nation's mainstream through what is called the New Age Movement. And now these demonic influences are everywhere in America. America, a nation founded on Judeo-Christian principles, whose founding fathers prayed for divine guidance at the Constitutional Convention of 1787. But now, a nation whose spiritual focus at all levels is moving away from the God of the Bible to other supernatural beings and experiences. I was 11 years old when I had what I consider a psychic experience. Meet Marcia Montenegro. She was one of the millions of Americans who sought fulfillment in the New Age movement. For almost 10 years, Marcia was a professional astrologer. I did have a spontaneous out-of-body experience when I was in college. And I was told by some people that if you awakened these powers in you, they would increase and they would accelerate, and that was very exciting to me. But Marsha's quest for spiritual success through the New Age movement ultimately led to horror, uncontrollable out-of-body experiences. I would be trying to go to sleep, and all of a sudden I would leave my body. And sometimes it would happen three or four times in a row. Think Marsha is alone? Think experience. again. In the United States, the New Age movement has grown from virtually nothing 30 years ago to as many as 12 million active participants in the New Age movement today, with another 30 million avidly interested in it. Over 80% of the nation's newspapers carry astrology columns, and one 1987 study found that 67% of American adults read astrology columns. Undoubtedly, the New Age movement is blossoming in America. It is by far the greatest challenge ever to face Christianity in America. Approximately 30 million Americans believe in reincarnation. One in four Americans believe in a non-personal energy life force. The New Age movement is also big business. There are 2,500 occult bookstores in the United States, and sales of New Age-related products are over $1 billion. All of this interest in New Age occultism has attracted the attention of businesses, too. According to the Wall Street Journal, dozens of United States companies, including Ford, Procter & Gamble, Polaroid, and TRW, have spent millions of dollars on so-called New Age workshops. Where do New Age concepts come from? 
Over the last three decades, Eastern ideas, many of them from India, have influenced New Age thinking. In fact, many New Age ideas about man, God, salvation, and the world are rooted in Hinduism. This mixture of East and West has many people thinking a new age is dawning. I think we're breaking into a new era of spiritual awareness. It seems to me that people are looking for something um, meaningful, and I think I think we're moving. We're, I think we're revolutionizing how we approach our lives. One of the key practices of the occult, spirit guides. Although Christian scholars warn that spirit guides amount to nothing less than seeking help from demons, many New Agers believe strongly in such guides. And as biblical teachings and prayer have left public education, spirit guides, along with other New Age practices like meditation, have found their way into the public schools. One of the most prevalent fields for New Age and occultic practices, the entertainment media. Tune in to Late Night Television and you're sure to catch the ever-present Psychic Friends Network. We gathered really the best psychics from around the country and not only has the response been from the people at home overwhelming, but from the psychic community as well. We now have only the very, very best psychics available anywhere and each is a master psychic. Almost like a church testimonial, here is how the Psychic Network presents callers talking about what they say a psychic has done for them. I'm, I'm happy. I'm like, I've never been so happy before. That's just because I called the psychic. And now, spirit guides get starring roles in movies like On Deadly Ground and TV shows like Star Trek Voyager. In a recent episode of Voyager, the lead character sought spiritual knowledge on finding her animal guide from the ship's Native American first officer. Will it help me find my animal guide? Eventually, you'll have to assemble your own medicine bundle. But this will allow me to assist you in your quest for a guide. Speak to it. What do I say? You know what you want to ask. Perhaps the biggest New Age influence within the last five years to hit the silver screen was the 1990 blockbuster Ghost. In it, the main character, played by Patrick Swayze, plays a ghost who teams up with a psychic to avenge his murder. In this scene, Swayze's character possesses the psychic, played by Whoopi Goldberg. Influences like these in the movies are changing the way America views religion. I think that life is eternal. You know, I think we take on a body to um, learn certain things in each lifetime. So you believe in reincarnation? Then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ron Rhodes is author of the book, The Culting of America. I see us continuing to go deeper and deeper into different forms of occultism in a respectable way. I see the New Age movement and the different areas of spirituality that are affiliated with the New Age movement as attaining more and more and more respectability. And one of the ways New Age occultism has spread into the nation's mainstream is the current fad interest in angels. It's amazing how clearly angels have uh, erupted, if you will, in our society and have captivated the imaginations of people across this country. If the number of books published on angels is any indication, many Americans are fascinated with these New Age angels, many of whom bear no relationship to biblical angels. There's been a turning where angels can be commanded by individuals, they can be prayed to, angels can heal us, they can redeem us, they can lead us to a higher spiritual level. And so with this turn, we have to be very clear in our understanding that the books out there on angels are not talking about the angels we've seen in the Bible. And so the New Age movement, with its emphasis on occultism and numerous supernatural beings, is leaving many people isolated and spiritually hungry. There's a great deal of spiritual cyanide being propagated out there today. And if you buy into some of these religious ideas that are part of cultic systems, and uh, systems of different world religions, you will spend eternity apart from God. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible tells us at the end of the age, there's going to become deception upon the world, that men will believe a lie, and they will be destroyed by the lie. We are seeing in the land of the United States of America, once a shining light to the nations of the earth, the willing acceptance of a lie. Well, where does the deception of the New Age movement and Eastern religions lead? There's no greater example 
than a country where there are 350 million people in grinding poverty. That nation, India, a nation fallen prey to idolatry. New Age mysticism, Hinduism, occultic practices, idol worship. These practices are woven into the fabric of one of the oldest and most populous nations on earth, India. For the past 20 years, America has imported and mainstreamed these same beliefs and practices. What has been the cost for this kind of idolatry? Is India's grinding poverty, disease, and desperate squalor the price that India has paid? And could America be next? Recently, Pat and a CBN team went to India, and they were shocked by the answer they found next to one of India's sacred rivers. It's dawn here in Rajamundri, and various uh, worshippers are bringing sacrifices to their particular gods uh, down here to the river. Some put the sacrifices into the river, and others place them in little booths around the river where they uh, have statues of bulls or statues of the goddess Kali. And there they come to worship. This is a ritual repeated every morning here. And my son Gordon is here. Gordon, what does all this mean? Wherever they feel any sort of inspiration, Inspiration, whether it's by a river or under a tree or on top of a hill, they figure that some god or some spirit is responsible for that. And so they'll worship the river, or they'll worship that tree, they'll worship that hill, or they'll worship anything. From well, we, we passed a statue of a god of destruction whose name is Shiva. They had a, had a, uh, a cobra wrapped around its uh, head, and he apparently had water flowing out of his head. What is the significance of Shiva in this river? Shiva's sperm is supposedly this river. Are these people wash in the river, what is that supposed to do? They're supposed to wash away their sins in the sperm of the god. They really believe that this god is real. It's, this isn't just some plaything. Yes, they've dedicated their city to him. That's why he's the major idol in the center of the city town. But there's apparently desperate poverty as well. There's dirt, filth, poverty. Wherever, wherever you find this type of idolatry, you'll find a grinding poverty. The land has been cursed. The Bible talks in terms of the land being cursed on behalf of what the inhabitants have done to it. You erect all these idols under every green tree, on top of every hill, you're going to curse your land. And the oppression, we see it in evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States of America stands on the edge of the same kind of a curse that took place in India. You say it can't happen here, it already is. Go look at the streets of New York, look at the streets of Washington, or any other major city. Look at the homeless, look at the desperate poverty, look at the breakup of homes, look at all the indices of social uh, decay, and you say, is there a root to it? Well, the major root is we've gone away from God. But some of you right now who are watching this program, you say, I don't want this in my life. And yet you've embraced reincarnation. You have embraced foreign devils. You have taken in idolatry. You think you're going to find some new age. You think you're going to find some, some great enlightenment of the soul. You go to India and you don't find any enlightenment. You find 100 million people because of the color of their skin who are called untouchables, just for starters. 350 in desperate poverty. Is that what you want? Would you want to serve Satan and have some spirit being try to destroy your body and, and destroy everything about you? The tarot cards, the Ouija boards, the psychic hotline, all of the paraphernalia in the New Age comes from one source, Satan. And you don't want Satan to take charge of your life and you don't want Satan to take charge of the United States of America. And yet willingly... We're moving into this as some type of, of uh, uh, mental uh, liberation or spiritual liberation from, quote, the bondage of Christianity. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ said this, and I repeat it to you, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There is not uh, a, a multiplicity of uh, highways to God. There's only one. And his name is Jesus. That's what the Bible says, and that's what I believe. And if you want to know God, if you want to be spiritually enlightened, if you want the spirit of truth to come and guide you into all truth, if you want to know freedom and release and peace in your mind and heart, there is one answer, and that is through the cross of Jesus Christ. 
Now, right now, as we see clearly the signs of the end of the age, don't be one who's left out to the deception of the devil. The book of Revelation said, because of the flood of demons, men are going to cry out for death, but death will flee from them. It's going to be so horrible, they will beg God to die. All those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. They will plead with God to take their lives because the onslaught of demonic power will be so horrible. That's what the Bible tells us. You don't want that in your life. No way. Now, I want you to do something. I want you to renounce that. I want you to pray a prayer with me. I want you to let Jesus Christ come into your heart. And I want you to believe that he's the Savior of the world. And let him take over your life and drive that other out. Who the sun sets free, the Bible says, will be free indeed. Now, you pray with me wherever you are, husbands and wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, children, parents, wherever you are, pray now. And may the peace and the liberty of God come into your life, even as we speak. Pray these words, Jesus, that's right, pray with me, Jesus, at this moment, Lord, I renounce the New Age philosophy. I renounce the worship of devils. I renounce the occult. I renounce Satan, and I command Satan in your name to leave me. And Jesus, at this moment, I confess to you, Lord, that I believe you died for my sins. And Lord, at this moment, I open my heart to you, and I invite you to come in. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Give me salvation. Let me know the joy of believing. And Lord, set me free from the clutches of the enemy that I might be free in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you have heard my prayer. Thank you, Lord, that you have come into my heart. And now let me pray for you, Father, in the name of Jesus. For those who prayed with me, may the power of the Holy Spirit come upon them. May they know the reality of the gospel of Christ. And Satan, in the name of Jesus, at this moment, I bind you in the forces of evil. I cast the occult away from people in this audience. In Jesus' name, your power is broken. Amen and amen. Welcome to this vital series, Signs of the Times 95. Ancient scriptures warn of events to happen when the end of the age draws near. Earthquakes, famines, pestilence. Deadly diseases already stalk the world today, and experts warn the worst may be yet to come. The movie Outbreak is about a lethal monkey virus transmitted to humans. Was it merely science fiction? If that bug gets out of there, 260 million Americans will be dead or dying. No, the story was based on the true story of something called hemorrhagic fever viruses. It's called hemorrhagic fever because you end up bleeding from every orifice, literally. The TV movie from earlier this week, Virus, showed this brutal death from the Ebola Zaire virus. But could such a thing really happen? It is happening right now. Tuesday, officials in Zaire placed Kikwit, a city of 600,000, under quarantine after more than 100 people died of the Ebola Zaire virus. And in 1989, it almost happened here, when a similar virus ended up in the United States, within a few miles of Washington, D.C., and millions of people. Scientists feared that the virus was the lethal Ebola Zaire, which has no known cure. Instead, the nation's capital and the nation were spared a deadly outbreak, an outbreak which could have killed millions. Today, 
lethal microbes are scourging the world like never before in history. Laurie Garrett, author of The Coming Plague. I don't think anybody in the field thinks that we're prepared today to stop a truly dangerous epidemic from spreading like wildfire. The question seems to be not whether a super disease will explode around the world, but which disease will it be? And where will it strike? International travel makes the threat even more ominous as malicious microbes take wing in the bodies of their hosts, carrying disease anywhere a plane goes, and that can be anywhere in the world. But the possibility of a super plague doesn't require rare viruses from unusual locations. Some well-known disease could easily evolve into devastating plagues in years to come. One such famous disease of the past, now coming back strong, is tuberculosis, TB, which ravages the lungs and chokes its victims to death. It was treated by antibiotics. But if antibiotics aren't used properly, then the bacteria they treat can develop a resistance to the drugs and become much more difficult to treat. The worldwide misuse of tuberculosis antibiotics has created a super TB that eventually could become one of the most devastating plagues in history. And the world is already losing the battle against normal TB, which currently infects a third of the global population. And the same thing could happen with sexually transmitted diseases, which have grown to frightening proportions around the world. Sexually transmitted diseases now number over 50. AIDS, gonorrhea, syphilis, herpes, and chlamydia are just a few of them. STDs are also treated by antibiotics, and some of them are also evolving into super diseases, which can't be treated by normal means. For instance, there's super gonorrhea, which requires doses of antibiotics 100 times stronger than were needed in 1950. As a result, whole new classes of antibiotics are needed, but none are available. And how about an AIDS vaccine? That's 20 years off. Some experts say it can't be done at all. And viruses and bacteria aren't the only threats. There are parasitic diseases like malaria, which can't be fought with antibiotics at all. Malaria afflicts 300 million people in the world, and the most deadly of the four malaria varieties is rapidly developing resistance to anti-malarial drugs. So malaria could also develop into an immensely more powerful and widespread disease in the future. So the microbes are winning as they defy all known medical warfare waged against them. But there's still another threat. What happens when governments and terrorists start playing God with germs? Iraq, North Korea, and a host of nations are already planning biological warfare. Or consider the strange cult that allegedly used nerve gas in the Tokyo subway. Reports say they were developing germ warfare as well. Indeed, genetic engineering will soon allow amateurs to design malicious microbes, perhaps a super deadly HIV virus that would spread death and destruction through the air with a mere sneeze or cough. And even smallpox, eradicated 20 years ago, could come back if it were stolen from the Russians who keep the virus in this insecure Moscow building. All it would take would be one thief to sow seeds of death worldwide in just hours. So with man's inability to outsmart the microbes and the possibility of bioterrorism looming on the horizon, last year's fictional TV miniseries the stand begins to look prophetic. Why me, huh? Why me? And you've had plenty of those, thank hey, you very much. Give that back. No, ma'am. I'm not going to stand here in the middle of five million dead people and watch you commit suicide. No! Indeed, the chances of one global catastrophic disease grow every day. Let us suppose the next scourge operates on a time scale of days, weeks, or months. I'm telling you, if something new broke out tomorrow, the drug to deal with it would be years away. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Kickwit is not that far away. CBN is operating or Operation Blessing, a farm that's on the way to Kitwick in the Bandundu province. Uh, there was a relief airplane, one of the small planes that Operation Blessing had, that set down in Kitwit just about two weeks ago. The pilots had to uh, get another ride home. The plane is still there with two guards now under quarantine. We understand that this Ebola virus has now moved down the road toward Kinshasa, and the workers go back and forth. Uh, from that uh, Bandundu province into the highly populated city of uh, uh, Kinshasa. I'm going to Zaire myself on Saturday, but I'm not particularly worried about my own safety, but what I am concerned about is what is happening in the world. Jesus said in the last days there would be pestilence. And I give you that definition again. Any contagious or infectious disease that is fatal or harmful, especially an epidemic of such disease. That is one of the signs of the times. We have been adding day after day after day the clear message of what is happening in the world. And we are relating it to biblical truth because there is no doubt that prophecy is being fulfilled in our lifetime. Now, Jesus said for those who knew him, when these things come to pass, lift up your eyes, lift up your head, for your redemption draws near. But for those in the world who do not know Jesus Christ, the prospects of the future are very frightening. We're not here to frighten people, but at the same time, when we consider the Ebola and the Marburg virus that was present in Reston, Virginia, in a monkey lab where the monkeys were dying of this dread disease and the uh, workers were terrified that somehow that disease would spread from Reston and wipe out the nation's capital. There was that close. Somehow it was contained through the grace of God, but the danger was there. And the jungles of Africa, whether it's found uh, uh, in um, Kenya, whether it is found in Uganda, whether it is found in Zaire, is only to, they're only 24 hours away from any city on the face of the earth. That's how close it is. 24 hours by jet or less. Europe is much closer, seven or eight hours. The United States, 15 to 16 hours. To those jungles where these diseases apparently have had their origin along with the HIV AIDS virus, which seems to have come from some kind of an experimentation that went on in Zaire. God spoke to me. He said, you're going into Israel, the land of the Bible. He said, you don't make any mistakes here because this is a land that whatever you do is affecting Bible prophecy. Now, a 700 Club special, Signs of the Times. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this special series. Today, the last day, Signs of the Times 95. This week, we have examined astonishing and remarkable signs, but none are as globally significant as the events surrounding the tiny nation of Israel. Is it a sign of the times pointing to the end of the age? Wars and rumors of wars. Spiritual deception. Earthquakes. Plagues. And famine. All of these mark the biblical signs of the end of the age. Scoffers say that such things have happened throughout history, and there is nothing new under the sun. But there is one sign that no one can dispute the greatest sign of the end of the age, the restoration of the Jewish people from around the world to their homeland of Israel, and the battle for peace in the Middle East. In one day, in May of 1948, the land of Israel was reborn brought forth in one day after nearly 1,900 years of non-existence. The very next day after Israel's rebirth, six nations attacked her, ushering in an era of war and bloodshed. But Israel survived the constant attacks of her Middle Eastern enemies, and then in 1967, 
became the fulfillment of another major prophecy of the end of our age. Just as Israel's neighbors went to war against her immediately in 1948, so also do Muslims consider Jewish control of Jerusalem to be an outrage, leading to still another sign of the times. Jerusalem is the stumbling block for peace in the Middle East. Many Muslims want to return the city and its Islamic holy sites to Islamic control. And although PLO leader Yasser Arafat has made peace with Israel on paper, he has promised his followers that the Palestinian flag will someday fly over Jerusalem. Throughout all this turmoil in the Middle East, still another prophecy is being fulfilled. Indeed, in the past few years, fulfilling the prophecy of Jeremiah, Israel has seen the dramatic return of hundreds of thousands of Jews to a homeland they had never seen before. More than half a million have come from the former Soviet Union and still more from the former communist nations of Eastern Europe. Even as Israel gains more people and works for peace with its neighbors, many of those same neighbors are still preparing for war. The Middle East Intelligence Digest reported an ominous remark in January. A former top-ranking Egyptian military official said, the war with Israel is a certainty and we are ready. And in April, a top Syrian general said his nation is preparing for war in case current peace talks with Israel collapse. What do all of these things point to? To the end of the world as people have known it from the beginning. To the end of life as they have always known it. To the return of the Messiah. And to the beginning of a whole new world. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking to you about the signs of the times. This is the last of this special series. Today we look to the great fig tree, if you will. When Jesus said, when you see the fig tree begin to bud, you know that summer is coming. And when you see these things, Israel begin to come back, you know that the end is drawing nigh. This is God's special time clock. The little tiny nation of Israel, regathered from the Gentiles in 1948 and created as a nation. In 1967, something very profound happened, which was a direct fulfillment of prophecy that we had waited for for over 2,500 years. And here's what it was. Jesus said in Luke 21, 24, Jerusalem shall be trodden underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Jerusalem began to be trodden underfoot of the Gentiles in the year 2586 B.C. Or excuse me, 586 B.C. 586 B.C. under Nebuchadnezzar. That's when it was trodden underfoot when he sacked the temple of Jerusalem. And Jesus said, from that time, the Gentile powers will reign supreme. There will be the Babylonian Empire, and of course the Persian Empire, and the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire, and now, if you will, the Empire of the United States of America, or the British, all these empires empires will come and they will rule. And when you see the time that Jerusalem is no longer trodden underfoot of the Gentiles, then you know that the times of the Gentiles is over. When did that take place? In our day and age, 1967, it started June 5, 1967. It was almost 2,500 years or thereabouts since the time, but what was called the Six-Day War, from that moment on, the Jewish nation has been in charge of all of Jerusalem. They took over the East Jerusalem, the West Jerusalem, they took over the Wailing Wall, they have it all. And the clock began to tick 
And in my estimation, there is a generation. And how long is a generation? A generation, according to the Bible, is 40 years. And if I were going to do some numbering and dating, I'm scared to do it because the Bible says you've got to be careful of it. But I would start the clock ticking here and I would count it out 40 years until something very significant happens because we're in the generation of the decline of the Gentile powers and the ascendancy, at least spiritually, of Israel. And the Apostle Paul said this, blindness in part it has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So here you've got times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The Apostle Paul uses the term fullness of Gentiles. And what does he mean by that? Well, he's talking about the great harvest, if you will, the spiritual gathering together in to the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is reflected in the, in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, when the, the, the last of the Gentile people has come to the Messiah, then all Israel will be saved. That's what the Bible says. That is what it is saying, ladies and gentlemen. And I want you to know, as we've been showing you the signs of the times, we mentioned about the question of currency where uh, a computer could hold all the money of the world in the sense you couldn't buy or sell without having some mark uh, identifying it. We talked about the rise of the occult, false Christ, false messiahs, false religions. Uh, we have talked uh, about the natural disasters, the pestilences. Uh, we have talked about various uh, activities in the nations of the earth and uh, of course the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the um, terrible earthquakes and all the things that have been happening in our world. We have talked about many things dealing with prophecy and this last day we're talking about the time clock which is Israel. Now Jesus Christ said these words about uh, the work that we have to do. It's found in the Gospel of John. He said we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. Now, while prophecy unfolds in the Middle East, there is a tremendous struggle and tragedy in the lives of the people who live there. But a voice of truth rings through that troubled land proclaiming the return of a king. And we sit here and we talk about the fact that the gospel is now being preached around the world and now it's back where it started. That's Almost right. as though God is closing the circle. Back where it started, to the cradle of civilization. These words by the 700 Club's Ben Kinchlow echo the thoughts and hopes of a growing number of people. Could it be that the world is entering what has been called the last days? This CBN partner thinks so. One of the signs of the end times is that the nation of Israel is coming together and fulfilling God's word. And CBN is being a part of that is actually fulfilling God's promise to bring the nation and the region the gospel. More than a dozen years ago, CBN founder Pat Robertson started Middle East Television, a TV station which brings quality family programming to this troubled region. It does something more. It brings the life-changing message of the gospel to millions through television, video cassettes, and literature distribution. Pat says when he first got the call to fire up MET's powerful signal, he took that call seriously. God spoke to me. He said, you're going into Israel, the land of the Bible. He said, you don't make any mistakes here. Because this is a land, Ben, that whatever you do is, is affecting Bible prophecy. With that mandate and warning, Robertson has continued broadcasting to the region, in spite of opposition, even rocket attacks against the station. And as those broadcasts continue, the message of the gospel is hitting home. What's going on on the air through the Middle East and TV, it's a miracle. Once a day, I watch the television and it was the 700 club and they said let's pray with us. 
I pray with them and I get the celebration. I feel happy. As he was watching it, he was not a believer, just a secular Israeli. He, he received the healing, I think it was in his back, and it was powerful, and he knew this works. He knew this is true. I believe it's one of the signs even of his second coming, that there is Middle Eastern TV. With reports like these, CBN partners are glad they're involved with Middle East television. Now reaching into the heart of Jerusalem, saying to the cities of Judah and to all of the Middle East, Behold your God. It's a very humbling experience to know that you can be a part of fulfilling prophecy that is written in God's Word. I would really encourage other people to get involved with CBN, with the Ministry of Middle East Television, because it is what God wants CBN and partners with CBN to do to fulfill the coming of Christ. The good news is, ladies and gentlemen, we actually are, are, are on the air in Jerusalem on cable. We're on the air virtually from Dan to Be Beersheba through the, the uh, Israeli cable. And uh, the interesting thing is, is that the 700 Club is coming into Israel on the Astanka No television network, which is broadcast on the Inter Sputnik satellite and is carried in Russian on Israeli cable to the many Russian uh, Jews that have come to Israel. And so they see the 700 Club Superbook and Flying House in Russian, as well as people see it in English and Arabic uh, all over that region. So we are in a strategic place. Now, folks, we need your help. I hope you've been moved by this important video special. And if you want to make a deeper commitment to our Lord or want to discover the joy of knowing Jesus for the very first time, please call our National Counseling Center. Someone is standing by at our phones day or night to share God's love and pray with you. In conclusion, I'd like to encourage you to pass on this videotape to a friend or loved one. Its powerful stories and ministry are a wonderful witnessing tool. And if you haven't already, please read the letter enclosed with this tape. Your prayers and gracious gifts will help us continue to fulfill the Great Commission together. Thank you, and God bless you.